What's up, everybody? Bonjour. Comment ça va? Uh, je m'appelle Simon. Et je suis américain. And this is episode 62 of Simon and Acti Movie Reviews. And I'm here with my beautiful wife. Uh, say hello to the people. Uh, bonjour. Je m'appelle Actenis. And uh, je suis Turk. <laughs> I don't know how to say Turkish in French. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why do you sound so sexy speaking French? Uh, because the uh, French, you know, it's a sexy language. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, this is episode 62 and we are reviewing Anatomy of a Fall, the 2023 French legal drama film. Acti picked this last night. We watched it. Well, we started watching it last night and finished it up this morning. The movie's about two and a half hours long. So, you know, I, I was sleepy last night. So, <laughs> but we finished it, uh, only a few minutes ago and I really enjoyed it. How did you feel after we watched it? I enjoyed it as well. I thought like, yeah, we've seen, or at least, you know, a lot of people have seen a lot of court dramas sort of murder mystery sort of dramas but i like the how they framed it i like the cinematography and how they sort of so showed like different elements of a crime if yeah. that makes sense yeah yeah this film felt like a mix of like 12 angry men but in france a little bit and I really enjoyed 12 Angry Men, which was another choice that you picked for us to watch, like, early on in our series. And it was interesting for me to also see, like, the French legal system be on play on screen. And also the acting as well, because this is a very narrative-driven drama and also acting-based drama. So everybody had to come on point with their, you know, sit, you know their skills on screen. So it was it was cool to see it that way. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think the acting was good. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any of the, you know, people who were acting in this movie beforehand. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if they were famous or whatever, but yeah. The best actor goes to the dog. <laughs> or his real name is Messi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, every acting was good, but the dog was just adorable. Yeah, exactly. So shout out to the cast. We have Sandra Hula, who plays Sandra Voiter, the main character. She's the woman who's a writer uh, accused of murdering her husband. We have Swan Arald, Arlald, who plays Vincent, the lawyer. We have Milo Machado Graner as Daniel, which is the young boy, the daughter of Sandra. And we have Antoine Renart as the prosecutor in the case. Samuel Thesis, Theus, plays Samuel Molesky, the husband, I believe, of Sandra, right? It's funny that the main characters are playing their actual names. Do you think they, you know, said, okay, Sandra, you're going to play a character called Sandra, and Sam, you're going to play a character called Sam to make it more believable when they have those arguments or discussions? What do you think? Mm. I think it might have been a little, like, play of the director, because mm -hmm. the film discusses this idea between, like, what is fiction and what is real. Mm -hmm. So, also, the director maybe wanted to incorporate those two elements. Like, what is fiction? What is real? We have mm -hmm. two people who are married, who are playing, you know, a married couple with their own names. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe they wanted the actors to also, like, be invested yeah. in the story. I don't know. Yeah, that's my theory. I think, you know, be invested in the story by feeling like you're playing yourself. And I think anybody who's, you know, a, an adult has been in a relationship and had arguments, had fights, or thought about killing that person you're with. I'm, I'm joking. I've never thought about killing acting. But, you know, sometimes you have those fights that just bring you to the edge. I hope that's not used in, like, court later, years from now, if I die. <laughs> acting's going to be accused of killing me. <laughs> And you just, <laughs> you're the one who brought it up. I never thought of killing you. What the hell? Please don't. Please don't. All and right. Stop. I never think of killing anybody and you're like the <laughs> least furthest person away from that idea. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, by the <laughs> way, if anybody's listening to this in the future, my wife, uh, did not kill me and, uh, I did not commit suicide either. <laughs> wow. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, but yeah, this film was made by Justine Triette. Uh, she is a female French film director, screenwriter, and I believe an author as well. No, editor, sorry. And this is actually her fifth film. She's made uh, a few others, and she basically started in 2012. And this is the one I believe that's getting her the most prestige and clout and everything. What did you think of, like, the directing in this film and the cinematography and everything? Uh, there were, like, interesting scenes that you don't really see normally in a classic, like, court drama. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was good. I think it was like, there were scenes that made this movie different from just like regular dramas. There was some like artistry in there and, or yeah. like just the director trying to do something different. So I liked it. I got you. For me, I wasn't blown away by the cinematography. I can say like, I didn't see anything on screen that I feel like I haven't seen done before with the camera or with directing or angles or anything like that. Once again, I think the highlights of this film are the acting and the story in and of itself that's compelling rather than, you know, interesting shots and things like that. It would have been cool to see maybe, you know, drone shots of like the French Alps and, you know, a panned out camera from the courtroom and stuff like that. But uh, I don't think it would have been necessary to bring this film more to life. Yeah, I mean, there were like a couple of zoom ins, you know. Uh, surrounding the accident and then also some like different uh, shots where we hear a different audio mm -hmm. I, th I think so yeah, yeah those things uh, yeah there weren't like anything we haven't seen before but I thought it was just like an interesting take I got you I got you Okay, so let's get into the story. I'm going to be reading from the wiki, and then Acti and I will react to different chapters of this film and uh, basically break down the paragraphs as they tell the story. So, in an isolated mountain chalet near Grenoble, which is in, like, the south of France, uh, in the Alps region, stuff like that, the novelist Sandra Voiter decides to reschedule her interview with a female student because her husband, university lecturer Samuel Maleski, plays music loudly in their attic, disrupting the interview. After the student drives away from the chalet, Sandra's visually impaired son, Daniel, takes a walk outside with his guide dog, Snoop. When they return home, Daniel finds Samuel dead from an apparent fall. What did you think about, like, the opening you know, scenes when we have the murder happen and everything like that. Yeah, it was, it was interesting also, but a little bit cliche as well, I guess, uh, which did not reflect on the rest of the movie. But like in the beginning, we see this, you know, woman who we assume is a writer. And uh, yeah, it's like that there was that cliche of like writers are interesting and they're weird and they, you know, they don't just interview People, they don't just get interviewed. They want to know more about people, da, da, da. Like, there was that sort of cliche. Um, and also when I heard the music, the music was good. <laughs> um, it was like a diff different, like, jazzy, weird version of, like, the 50 Cent song, P-I-M-P. But, yeah, I thought if I was the writer, I would go upstairs and, like, get mad at my husband. <laughs> mm. I, I disagree with you a bit that it was cliche for the murder to happen because when the film opens with Sandra having that conversation with Zoe, the student, it seems like Zoe is pissed off that Sandra basically wrote a book with her as one of the main characters or characters in them in general and basically like took her life to write about. And I thought the film was actually going to go... I thought Zoe was actually going to have a more prominent role in the film because there was that sort of confrontation with Zoe confronting Sandra about that. What did you think about that? Um, I mean, I didn't know if she was going to be involved in the story or not. And also, like, when she left, I assumed that that was just, like, an encounter. But... Yeah, I mean, there was that questioning of, like, what what do you base your writings on? And is it okay to use uh, reality and take other people's lives and put it in your book? Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, there's there was another connection that I made later, but we'll get to that. So, I don't I know. You. I got you. I just felt like, you know, the film having the murder happen so soon with a character that we weren't introduced to. I think that shows the master of this narrative 
like how good this story is because how are we supposed to care about this guy that we never saw on screen? We just see his dead body when his son discovers him. So how the story continues on afterwards, that's really, really good. And uh, it also, you know, really brought you into the action quickly because I'll, I'll be real with you. When I see a bunch of like, you know, <laughs> very uh, plain, plaid, staid looking Europeans on screen in like the Alps somewhere, I'm like, okay, I'm ready for a slow burn movie. Okay, a lot of, <laughs> it's going to be a lot of build up before we get to the action. Oh shit, a nigga's dead. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. I was scared of that too. I'm not going to mm. lie. I thought maybe it might have been a slow burn, but mm. I was also glad that like stuff happened right ahead and yeah, they didn't slow burn the first part at least. Yeah. Yeah. And uh I also like how at at the beginning of the film you don't really know that Daniel has a seeing problem. Like he's not one of those blind kids or partially blind kids who wears like sunglasses or move his moves his head like Stevie Wonder or Ray Charles. He acts normal and then we find out later actually not even in the beginning first 15 minutes I would say you find out later oh he actually has a seeing impairment from an accident that happened to him. So uh I also liked that part um yeah and once again once again the the french alps look beautiful at least from what we see i mean i just love mountains i love snow i love all of that environment what did you think of like the scenery it, this might be a side note but what did you think yeah it was it was a beautiful scenery but also it did give the sense of like uh like a bit of i don't know like thriller mm -hmm. because you know we've seen those movies like shining Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a snowy mountain cottage house, whatever. And then there's like a murder or there's something scary that's happening there. So yeah, it definitely did have that vibe. And I thought that was maybe like a influence of other scary movies that yeah. have the same setting. That's a, that's a good mix. This film is 12 Angry Men meets The Shining in France. <laughs> wow. <laughs> As a, anytime you have a white family in the mountains, in the snow somewhere, somebody's got to die. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. That's a good mix. No, no, that's a good mix. Yeah, The Shining meets 12 Angry Men. But uh, yeah, uh, Dog was cute. We were introduced to Snoop and Daniel and Sandra, but we just see, you know, dead Samuel in the snow. My initial theory, you know, when we see Samuel's dead, I'm thinking... Zoe did it. I'm thinking Zoe did it. Did you have any initial theories when we first see the murder happen? Uh, I was leaning towards uh, Sandra, mm -hmm. but I wasn't sure. Like, I was also... Because when she was talking to Zoe, she was looking annoyed. And obviously, like, your mind just uh, automatically goes to maybe they had a fight and maybe she pushed him. Mm -hmm. So that's that was my automatic like thinking, but um, I knew this was like a court court movie, so I was thinking, okay, maybe it's not like I don't. Let me see where the story takes me. Yeah, but why and would you think it was Zoe? Okay, I thought it was Zoe because she was once again, like I said, pissed at the very beginning of the movie that uh, you know Sandra was writing about her. So maybe she had some vengeance she wanted to take out on Sandra, but then she met uh, her husband in the house when she tried to sneak back in and then ended up killing him and thought that was good enough. That's what I'm thinking. Okay. And then secondly, I was leaning towards Sandra because she was the only one in the house when, uh, you know, Daniel comes back and screams, mom, 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 you know, she runs out of the house and this seems kind of strange that she would be there, you know, only by herself. But I'm thinking I was still leaning towards Zoe had a role in it, you know, for some clandestine reasons. Mm, I mean, it's not a good enough theory for me. Um, but, yeah, I was also a bit, like, skeptical because there was loud music playing throughout, like, the first scene. And it was, like, very loud. So, yeah, I was skeptical because... Daniel was like yelling mom mom and she was he wasn't yelling like that hard and mm -hmm. there's this like music blasting from the house I was like how did she hear Daniel and then run out yeah 
So I was thinking that a little bit, and that's why, and and we didn't know anything about Samuel, right? Yeah, so we didn't know anything that's about That's what Samuel. I thought. Yeah, yeah. All right, but let's continue on in the story. So Sandra insists that the fall must have been accidental. Her old friend and lawyer, Vincent, suggests the possibility of suicide, while Sandra recalls her husband's attempt to overdose on aspirin six months earlier after going off antidepressants. After an investigation, Daniel's conflicting accounts of what happened shortly before his father's death, combined with the revelation that Samuel sustained a head wound before his body hit the ground, and an audio recording of a fight by Samuel and Sandra the previous day, Sandra is indicted on charges of homicide. Now, when I saw the, you know, head gash on Sam that, you know, he hit his head, and at this two-story chalet that they have, Right. There is like this shed that's there that he could hypothetically have hit his head on. Right. But it seems like almost too perfect that he would hit his head exactly that way. Uh, and on top of that, you know, the um, coroners, when they did the autopsy on Sam, said that this uh, head gash that he had happened before the fall. Right. So. I was thinking, once again, it, it either points to Zoe or Sandra, or even worse, Snoop. But <laughs> what did you think about all of all of that that was revealed when, you know, the police were investigating the house? Sandra was saying that her husband was on antidepressants. Uh, the lawyer comes. He's introduced. What did you think about all of those things? Um, I thought Sandra's story was shady when, like, she repeats what she told to the police to her lawyer. And I thought it was shady because she said, like, she's she had earplugs on after she talked to his, her husband. And then, like, she fa fall asleep. Mm -hmm. And uh, sh how can you have earplugs on, you fall asleep, and then you hear your son yelling. And y suddenly, like, you can hear your son yelling throughout the music, throughout the earplugs. Mm -hmm. And then she mm -hmm. said something like, I guess one of the earplugs might have fallen off. Like... Mm -hmm. If that was the case, then you would have like w woken up by the music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that that felt a little bit shady, and also like I wasn't sure about the relationship between her lawyer, uh, Vincent, and herself because it was obvious that they knew each other. Because mm -hmm. she said something like, "It's weird seeing you like this after all this time," mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. So I wasn't sure if she was, like, cheating on Samuel with Winston, or she did, like, long ago, long before. Mm -hmm. I had, like, theories of my own. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I also thought, because the autopsy report said it might have been an accident slash intentional murder, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and then they were sort of, like, going through the house, looking at the evidence, trying to recreate scenes. Uh, which is very interesting technique. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking like, nothing is solid in this case. So how, how would you decide what is true or not mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well? Like, how is, how is the film going to decide that? Yeah. When, uh, we're first introduced to Vincent and Vincent is asking her what happened and what was her relationship like with Sam. Vincent even says, I don't believe, you know, Sandra's story. I don't believe this actually happened at first. You know, he can't even make sense of it, really. And I think, you know, this film sort of proves something that I've been saying for a while, that when we watch movies, the people that are the main characters, we are rooting for them. That's why they're the protagonists. That's where the word, you know, pro comes from, like positive, right, in this case. And in all other circumstances, if Sandra was a side character or Daniel was the main character of this story, right, we would be side-eyeing his mother. But I feel like when you watch this film, Sandra doesn't come across as shady. She comes across as believable. Her tears seem real when she's mourning her husband and the loss of life and the innocence that her son no longer has because she, he saw her father die. It makes us root for Sandra to be proven innocent when in all other cases, even her lawyer on screen comes there and says, I don't believe the story. You get what I'm coming from? Yeah. I don't know how I was feeling about her in the beginning, especially like I was rooting for her to an extent, but then I was also skeptical and thinking like, maybe she did do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, there was that like weird tension between me and Sandra yeah. <laughs> as the viewer. 
yeah, yeah. There was a video that you sent me from a YouTuber who broke down this film, and we watched it together before we started this live stream. And the YouTuber was talking about how narrative is how we come to some conclusion of the truth. And uh, in the story, after Samuel's death, everybody's trying to construct their own narrative. And at the chalet, there's like three, there's two upper stories. There's like the second floor and then there's like the attic uh, below the roof. And the narrative that the prosecutors try to create and the police try to create is that, you know, he fell from the second floor after getting hit on the head. But, you know, there's a second narrative that the defense tries to claim that he was actually on the attic floor and fell and hit his head on the uh, shed and that sort of stuff. And I find that interesting to look at this film like, okay, there's various different narratives that are created by various people. And which one is the most believable one that we sort of come to the conclusion about? And that's what we're seeing the beginning of at those early scenes. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting because it leads to a bigger question if you look at the whole of the movie as well. Like, how do we know if something is true? How do we know facts? How -hmm. do we have facts? Because if everything comes from sort of our interpretation of everything that happened and everyone's interpretation, everyone's perspective is different, then how come we can have solid definitions and solid facts? Um, so, and especially when it comes to like incidents like this uh, in front of the law, but also like so many other things, like things that we don't see and don't physically, you know, they're not physically available to us. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, of course, if you can see DNA, you can prove that it's there. But what about like concepts like love or hate or democracy, you mm-hmm. know, just things like that? How do we know? these things are what they are. Right. I mean, I want to push back against subjective truth, thinking that everybody has their own truth, uh, because I think there are circumstances, like the case of a murder, where there is objective truth. And I don't think that should be sacrificed in the case of just everybody having individual truth, if that just makes us feel better. Um, in, in, In the cases that you're speaking about, I would say, like, for love or hate, democracy, those sorts of things, uh, those are, you know, uh, amorphous things, things that are changeable, things that can, that, that can come in different forms and sizes and shapes. Like the love of a mother is different than the love I have for my wife, right? And democracy, is it representative democracy? Is it, uh, direct democracy? Like there's various shades of those things. But when it comes to did Sandra kill her husband or not, that's a objective truth that we, you know, sort of have to try to find conclusions to using logic, reason, facts, evidence, that sort of stuff. What do you think? Yeah, but the only one who knows the truth is Sandra. Even after the movie ends. She's not the only one. Huh? She's not the only one. Samuel knows the truth too, but he's dead. Well, Samuel is dead now, so it doesn't matter what he knows. Like, he's not able to tell the truth. So... I mean, she doesn't know... Okay, I'm not going to spoil it yet, but... As of right now, we know in the film that Sandra only knows her truth of what she is telling us and also what she, you know, experienced. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, no, it's OK. I mean, I, I just meant to say, like, Sandra knows whether she killed her husband or not. <laughs> OK. Like sorry. you're saying the objective truth. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, the subjective. Sorry. No, 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 objective truth. Objective. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. I always struggle with those two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, mm-hmm. uh, and when it comes to, like, the other stuff I was talking about, like, yeah, those things are not, like, factual things, and all, also they're subjective, like, concept of love. But, for example, you and me, mm-hmm. we decided to live our lives together and get married and be dedicated to each other for the rest of our lives uh, sort of depending on our conception of love. You mm-hmm. think you love me and also I love you. Mm-hmm. And I think the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But our definition of love might be completely different. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's like, yeah, these are sub- subjective like terminologies, but then we decide to put them in our lives 
like their objective. Mm. I I see where you're coming. I see where you're coming from, and (laughs) I gotta be petty, and I gotta bring this up because we had a big fight about that when we were. um, I was talking about my definition of love, and you were saying your definition of love. And then I got mad at you because yours wasn't exactly like the way I wanted it to be. <laughs> you remember that? Yes, yes. And that's that's the problem. And, uh, yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, when it comes, we're getting off track from the movie here, but I'll, I'll say this. I think this also relates to the film because Samuel and Sandra – had different conceptions on what their responsibilities were in relationships. But I don't think that changes uh, a truth. I just think that that's separate from truth. You know, how I think about love and how you conceive of love, those are not, those are only true in the fact that we both think about love. But how we think about this idea doesn't mean that it's true, right? I think it's just generally close to a consensus of what people think love is. We know love is not abandoning a person. We know love is not killing a person in general, like 99% of the time, unless like mama's on life support. But like, they're, they're just generally in the same area, right? I think about, I think about these ideas. I just want to make it absolutely clear because we've gotten really philosophical. Is love truth? Can there be a truth in love? That's a deep philosophical question. I would say it's like a Venn diagram, right? In the circle, we have the concept love, and everybody has their own conceptions of what love is. And some are closer to like a consensus that overlaps with other people's, and then other circles don't overlap, but it's still in the fold, if that makes sense. And that's how I think we think about love. Do you get what I'm saying? I get what you're saying, but okay. <laughs> I don't know if I should continue this conversation, Why but I'm not? just asking. Go- Go ahead, go ahead. One question, like, okay, so, yeah, the the stuff that we have together in the Venn diagram that you just described, mm-hmm. uh, the the stuff in the middle, that's for sure love then. But what about, like, the other stuff that's left outside of the, of the common ones? Mm-hmm. Is that still love for the other person? I would say everybody has their own circle about how they define love, what adjectives they will put in there, nouns, verbs, whatever, right? If their part of the circle is outside of what the general consensus is about love, the bigger circle that other people's circles are in and that overlap with other people's, it's still their conception, right? It's still their truth. And that's their subjective truth about love. But I would say what generally falls in the overall bigger circle is like the objective truth that most people would agree on is falls under love, if that makes sense. You get what I'm saying? That makes sense, but that's also a bit problematic as well, I feel like, because the objective consensus on love is affected by everything we went through as humans. Mm -hmm. It's affected by, you know, sexism. It's affected by racism. It's affected by religion. It's affected by culture. Mm Mm-hmm. So how, you know, then how can we trust this objective, quote unquote, definition of love? Mm -hmm. Okay, I I get what you're saying. Yeah, of course, a black woman's conception of love is different than a white woman's conception of love, right? Because a black person might be saying, like, I need the person to love and understand what I go through as a black person. And a white person might be saying, I just need you to eat my potato salad with raisins. And love it because that's a part of love too. So like, I do understand what you're saying here, like about that. But I feel like once again, it, I feel like I've come to like a good middle ground of objective truth and subjective truth because everybody likes to say today, Oh, I have my truth and you have your truth, but <laughs> there also needs to be objective truth. We're not going to sit here and say like a, a woman who does horrible things to her children, you know, loves them, right? But somebody might say, well, if I spank my kids, I was raised that way, and that's me showing my love for them because I'm showing them I'm caring for them and I'm trying to protect them and teach them lessons. Do you get what I'm saying? So there's there's got to be some objective and subjective truth in there to make a thing like love make sense. Yeah, I mean, of course, I'm not denying that violence 
is like should be in love in the definition of love or anything like that. Like I'm not saying that. And yeah, there are certain things that fall outside of love, but I think what's more important is what falls inside of the terminology of love. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because we can probably agree what is not considered love, but it's harder to agree what is considered love. Um, But anyway, let's continue on with the movie. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But I think, I think we didn't get off track because I think the, the love that was there between Sandra and Samuel is a uh, big piece of this story. So when we had that whole sidetrack there, we didn't go off on some different tangent because I do think Sandra is still a woman who lost the man she loved. She loved him enough to have a kid with him, moved to his hometown in the south of France in the middle of nowhere and, uh, you know, continue working and trying to support his work and follow her husband's path to some degree while also keeping autonomy for herself as a working woman. You get what I'm saying? So I feel like, we we didn't go off to a different path, but what do you think? Yeah. That's also another thing. Like you said, you know, Sandra is the protagonist and we we're sympathizing with her to an extent. Right. And I was mm-hmm. also thinking in my head, even if she did kill her husband, I feel like she was dealing with guilt mm-hmm. uh, by killing him and, you know, taking him away from his, her child Mm -hmm. and then putting herself in that situation as well, et cetera, Mm -hmm. et cetera. So I was still sympathizing to her, even though there might be a possibility that she was the killer. Yeah. And then also I was thinking, okay, maybe she's not the killer. So, you know, right, right, right. I think, you know, uh, it's hard for me to say Sandra was feeling guilt uh, after watching the entire film and knowing how it ends, no spoilers yet for anybody who's listening and hasn't seen it, but the vibe she gave me at the beginning, she didn't come across as a person who was guilty that her husband died. She just was in total shock of what was happening in her life, right? And that's, once again, due to the great acting, due to her facial expressions, the the properly timed tears from the actor and everything like that. And uh, generally how she's dealing with the madness that's around her, you know, police all in her home, asking her all types of questions, police doing reenactments of the murder from her roof, uh, media uh, people outside of the courthouse asking her and her lawyer questions. So I didn't get the impression she was feeling guilt or emanating guilt. Do you get what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. I mean, yeah, that might also be interpreted as frustration Mm -hmm. from everything that was happening. Right. But back to the topic of love. I said earlier uh, that, you know, Sandra moved to this town from uh, from Germany. She's German. Her husband's French and they are living in her husband's hometown, which is like, once again, a small town in the middle of nowhere in the French Alps. Do you think there was real love between Sandra and Sam? I think there was. I definitely believe there was, but, um, I mean, this is something that I'm really scared in life because I've heard like billions of times that people say, you know, marriage changes people, marriage changes men. And I've seen it also like play it out in front of me, uh, from like my mom and my parents as well. So, yeah, that's what I was sort of seeing with their relationship as well. It's sort of like faded away, but, you know, they reconnected from being intellectuals, from being writers. So I thought, I thought, I think also like intellectually stimulating each other is a very important part of a relationship. And we have that in our relationship as well. Like you always teach me something and I'd like to believe that I teach you something as well or Not like teach even, but just make you see something from a different perspective. You do. Okay. So, yeah, I think that's what they had as well. And that makes the relationship alive for me Mm -hmm. to an extent, you know? So, yeah, I do think they were, they had love. Yeah. But I think, I think this would have been a better case of them getting people that are polar opposites (laughs) because you know, I think one of the issues in their life is that Sandra is good at writing because she actually does the work. She sits down at the computer and types it out, whatever, right? And, you know, Sam seems to be that guy who's like, yeah, I'm going to write my book one day, man. I'm going to get it done, man. 
And he might be very smart. He might be a more creative writer than her, but he doesn't do the essential part of writing. So I just think, you know, maybe you should find people that are opposite of you, you know? Sandra should be with, like, <laughs> you know, a rock star or, like, uh, you know, some artist or maybe just, like, a computer programmer, <laughs> an accountant. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Sam I mean, is, like, a big booty video vixen. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, I think that's where the feminism in this movie comes into play because that's what I thought when I was watching the movie. Sandra with her, you know, the things that she does in her relationship, even the way she looks and, uh, the, the stuff that like she says, she seems very masculine and it seems like Samuel also wants to be masculine as well because he's a man, but Sandra is more dominant when it comes to like distributing the roles and she's sort of giving him a bit of like, you know, traditionally seen female roles, like taking care of the kid and um, I don't know, like not making as money or not being as successful as her. Mm -hmm. These are like traditionally what we see, like, you know, in the dynamic of men and women in a, in a marriage. Uh -huh. So I thought that was, like, a, a bit of, like, one of the challenges of this movie. Uh -huh. They were trying to explore that idea as well. I get you. I mean, I don't know if it's just me, but I didn't see that uh, looking at the film at first. Now, when you say it, I see it now in reflection. But I don't know. The way I grew up, I grew up in a house with a with a mom who was hella successful hardworking, and she also cooked dinner, cleaned the house, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I grew up with, you know, my father in the house too, who was, you know, doing well for himself as well. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how to say this, but it's, it's hard for me to see like just a woman doing her job and then being like, oh yeah, she's being masculine. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, this is, we've seen this change in the recent years. So I'm not saying this is like what always happens now. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's just like a, I think it's a take on very traditional family life and mm -hmm. then sort of reversing it and showing us like what type of problems it causes. Mm -hmm. And maybe it could be a critique of like how even to this day, some French people see family structures. Mm -hmm. uh, since the, you know, the director is French and the family, the man is French as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like going more into it, like, you know, Sandra is accused by her husband that she's not spending enough time with the child. That's and and she's responding. I feel like how a man would, because she's saying, like, I didn't keep you away from not doing anything. You chose to do that. And I feel like that's a very, like, common argument used by men, even like Andrew Tate, <laughs> you know, that nobody forces you to do things, but it's like you have to do those things because if you don't do those things, then the, you know, the, the circle is not going to move. If you don't wash dishes, if you don't take care of the child, if you don't, you know, also work as well. Uh, some things are not going to go well and then it's going to be your fault and you're expected to do those things constantly. Mm -hmm. But Sandra kind of, you know, puts that expectation onto Samuel and she's like, I didn't tell you not to do it. Just because you have other things like chores and taking care of the child, it doesn't mean you can't do it. Like, come on. Right, right, right. Well, you're you're jumping ahead a bit because we haven't gotten to the argument part yet. Okay, But sorry. It's okay, it's okay. We're gonna break down the big old couple fight that happens. You know, I'm waiting for that too. But uh, one more thing I wanted to speak about is the bruise. So when the police come to Sandra's house, she says that you know the bruise that's on her wrist is from her constantly bumping into the kitchen counter. Um, what did you think about that when we first saw that on screen? Like. You know, did you did that make you raise more suspicion about her? Or did you think her story was believable? I thought this bee is lying. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she was lying because, like, <laughs> no, <laughs> that's such a like a general thing to say. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when people lie, they they might say just like those sorts of general things that you cannot really question, mm -hmm. like if it's a lie. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. What I would, about uh, you? I would say once again, I 
I was like, really expecting this film was going to have the twist that Zoe killed Sam or somebody else killed Sam. So, you know, I was actually believing her because I bumped my arm, wrist, toe into all sorts of stuff around this house. And we don't have much in this house. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that's kind of believable. Plus, like, white people bruise whenever you just even pluck them. So it's like, yeah, it, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but, like, yeah, of course, I do that, too. I bruise myself as well. But it's like, what is the coincidence of it, like, happening at the same freaking time, you know? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, hey, it could it could happen, I would say. That's the thing. Like, you know, we can never know the truth. All right. But let's jump to the next paragraph. So during the trial, Sandra's defense team claims Samuel fell from the attic window and hit his head on a shed below. While the prosecution posits Sandra hit him with a blunt object and pushed him from the second floor balcony. During a courtroom argument with Samuel's psychiatrist, Sandra admits her resentment toward her husband due to his partial responsibility for the accident that led to Daniel's impaired vision. So the trial happens like a year after the entire incident. And so, you know, she's living in the house with Daniel. Uh, they don't make her actually stay in jail, which is uh, the, the lawyers say is like unique because most people that are accused of homicide actually end up, you know, waiting in jail until their trial. And it's the same in the U.S. too. Uh, but I think what happens more often than not is that women get, you know, uh, more lenient tra- more lenient treatment in the criminal justice system, especially if they have kids as well. Uh, what did you think about, you know, that part of the film? Uh, I mean, it was definitely interesting because... It, was this the time that they also provided them with like this person to check them? Right? Yes. But what do, what do you think about the idea that, you know, Sandra got special treatment uh, because she's a woman and didn't have to wait in jail for, you know, her trial to start for the murder of her husband? I think it was just <laughs> because uh, later on, she's accused of certain things just for, being a woman that is that has written like a successful book and she's more successful than her husband uh and they try to pin it down in a way that you know she just like couldn't take enough of his complexes and then decided to kill him um so i think it's okay for her to like be home okay Okay. Like, if we're going to judge people on certain things, then it's okay to give them certain advantages as well. You take some, you lose some. <laughs> so you're you're going to say, okay, this is the good part about being a woman. You can get accused of killing your husband, but still get to watch Netflix and chill by yourself? I mean, i rather not both of them happen. You know, mm-hmm. if she's not judged because she's a woman in certain ways then yeah, like she shouldn't be at home and she should be convicted just like how a man would. Mm. But when she's on trial, she's not being like treated fairly, fairly or treated. um, She's, she's treated like she's emotionally motivated Mm -hmm. to do a murder because women are always emotional. Right. So uh, yeah. In in that case, like if it's going to be unfair treatment in that sense from the prosecutor, then she might as well go home. But if this was Sam being accused of killing Sandra, do you think he would have had that luxury? Um, no. Maybe. I mean, because the kid is visually impaired, right? Uh, so maybe if Daniel requested his father, that might have been the case. Yeah, but he's visually impaired because of an accident from his father. Even worse. Not from his father, like was, indirectly. Well, indirectly, but when the court found out, oh wait, your son almost got blind because daddy wasn't there to pick him up from school on time. Oh yeah, oh you're gonna sit in jail, and uh, we're gonna send your son to like a group home or something. I don't. I didn't feel like the court blamed him for the accident, and I don't even think Sandra blamed him or Vincent blamed him for the accident. No, 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 no. Don't get off this topic. You said. You know, Sam would have been let go too. I think you said that. Like, if Sam was accused of killing Sandra, he wouldn't be in jail either. 
Uh, I'm saying if Daniel requested his mother, his father to be with him, then they would have let him out because he's an impaired child. But if he didn't, then he would go to jail. Okay. 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 Um, I'm going to try to express this the best way I can. I feel like there are some men that might watch this film and be like, oh, this is how women want to be treated in the world. They want to be able to lie and get away with it. They want to be like proven innocent and get away with it. They want to be accused of crimes but not have to like suffer any consequences in the meantime. Meanwhile, if this story were reversed with a man on it, people would be like, yeah, that guy should be in jail. He most likely did it. Prime suspect. Uh, <laughs> take him away from his kid. All that sort of stuff. Now, my opinion is, like, I understand that, like, double standards, like you said, do work in that way. Like, we as men, we take advantage of so many double standards, right, that there also are double standards that work against us as well. A man can sleep with as many women as possible, and there won't be that much, you know, backlash from society on that, right? You also have to take the good and the bad, too, that, you know, it's going to be, uh, women are going to be much more selective with us, too. And so, therefore, you're not going to be able to just really sleep with any woman. You can sleep with a lot of them, but you won't be able to sleep with uh, most of them, in fact, that you'll try to get. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I get it. So, <laughs> I, was, I, I don't just, know what you're getting at. No, I, I'm just trying to, you know, make it clear. Like, I think this film, you know, it is a very feminist film when you, when you think about it and you talk about it. But I think... Um, there are some people that will watch this and be, you know, upset with the story it tells. Because, wait, this woman was accused of killing her husband, didn't sit in jail. Wait, she lied to the police officers and there were no consequences for that. That's a big no-no in America, right? And, um, yeah, I, like, there's so many things that Sandra sort of does that men would say, that's not fair. Bro, bro that's not fair. I couldn't do that, bro. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you you win some and then you lose some. And plus, like, lying in court, like, yeah, it's obviously a bad thing. But when she's caught lying, it only hurts her more. Mm. So it's not like it's in her advantage that she lied. Right. Uh, right. And I think, like, when it comes to, like, discussing it in the court and stuff, like, Samuel would have been treated the same way. If he lied, they wouldn't just automatically put him in jail. Right, right, right. Like, they would question him, like, how they questioned Sandra. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, we also have to, like, take in the fact that Samuel would have been accused differently than Sandra mm -hmm. just because he's a man. Right, right. Now, getting on to the court part of this uh, film. The first, Wait. First, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, uh, the court part of this film, the first person I believe to testify to the court is Zoe. Zoe, you know, says that she was there, she met with Sandra, blah, blah, blah. And then we're introduced to the prosecutor who's dressed in like this red robe, white guy with like a bald shaved head. And he's asking like the toughest questions. Honestly, we need prosecutors like him in America uh, to prosecute like all the, uh, you know, right wing terrorists and the MAGA crazy Republicans and Trump himself. So we need prosecutors like that. He was really good with his questioning and stuff. And he basically was asking questions to Zoe like, did you feel like Sandra was hitting on you? Did you know that that Sandra was like bisexual and that Sandra was attracted to women? And, you know, d did any of her questions make you feel like she was doing that? And then also, what did you think about the music? You know, the guy was playing the instrumental version of 50 Cent's P.I.M.P., a misogynistic song. Do you feel like he was trying to exert dominance? And so Zoe says, like, no, I didn't feel like Sandra was trying to hit on me. I didn't get that impression. But I did get the impression that, you know, the guy that I didn't see was trying to exert some force over us uh, without being in the room. What did you think about, like, Zoe's testimony? Uh, it was definitely very, very, like, in tune with the whole f feminist undertones of the movie. I felt like because why did they decide to make Sandra bisexual? And I was thinking that, like, why is she bisexual and not just, like, maybe, you know, f might have been flirting with a male interviewer and stuff like that. And it kind of 
gave me the sense of like, okay, she's bisexual and they're using it in court to make her seem like a sexual deviant a little bit. Like she, she would just flirt with anyone, uh, whether if it's a man or not. And she doesn't have any possibility of, you know, uh, just being friends with a person or just being interested in a person other than sexually. And once again, I feel like this makes Sandra look masculine because usually men are seen like that. You know, mm-hmm. men are seen as, oh, they're just like, they want to F everything mm-hmm. and everyone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's what I was thinking as well in the w- within that scene. What did you think? Um, that scene sort of kind of killed the idea that Zoe was going to be another prime suspect. Like the film's twist is going to be she was the killer. So my theory ended right there with her testimony. Uh, I also thought it was interesting that they made Sandra a bisexual character as well to open up the possibility that she could have been, you know, cheating on her husband or having affairs with women that she taught with. And yeah, like you said, you know, by making her attracted to women, it does open up the possibilities of her, you know, uh, having doubt on the story that she was just this loyal wife to her husband, right? She could have been, you know, trying to, uh, get her students or get with women. Right. And, um, what did you think about Zoe, you know, refusing to be called Mrs. Zoe or something like that? She didn't want to be relegated to being known as the wife of somebody. I thought she was like, obviously she was like a feminist or like a liberal woman when it came to stuff like that. But then I also thought she was somewhat, like she she believed that Sandra was innocent and she was trying to support her as well and try to like um like get out of this like sexist narrative that the prosecutor was trying to put on I see would you refuse to be called Mrs. Hill Uh I mean I'm married to you so why would I <laughs> If they if they She were wasn't like, married She was married I believe That's why no. they kept on calling her Mrs. Okay, I don't know. Maybe she was divorced. We don't know if she was married or not. Well, either way, would you say, oh, don't call me Mrs. Hill. I'm not owned by a man. Call me Miss Shaheen Hill. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't mind it that much because, um, you know, I do like the fact that I am Mrs. Shaheen Hill. Uh, and if they call me Miss Hill, then Mrs. Hill, then I don't, I wouldn't have necessarily a problem with that just because mm-hmm. I don't like dwell on too much details when it comes to that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I mean, if, the, if the talking point goes on for me, like me looking like your property. Yeah. Then I would oppose it, but you know, I got you. I got you. Yeah. It's Mrs. Hill. If you're nasty. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was, that was evil. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, as a psychologist, what did you think about the combative conversation between Samuel's psychologist who went up there in court and was like, Sam was, you know, telling me he wanted to get off his antidepressants, uh, and he was, you know, very combative in his last few sessions with me, complaining about his life and his wife and everything like that. And then Sandra said, you know, you know, you're saying all of this about Sam, but if I may, you know, couples fight. This is what naturally happens in relationships. And uh, you have your understanding of Sam, but I knew the man, you know, more intimately. And if I had a therapist that I complained to Samuel, that I complained to about Samuel all the time, she or he would come up here and say bad things about the man. So what did you think about? that, you know, reaction or interaction. Mm -hmm. I did not like the psychologist because he was supposed to tell what Danny, what, sorry, Samuel was like during the sessions. Right. Mm -hmm. And he didn't do that. It felt definitely like he was taking a side and he thought that uh, Sandra was guilty Mm -hmm. because of what was told to him. And the, the, the dangerous thing about like testifying as a psychologist is that the only evidence you have really is what your clients tells you. And sometimes your client might tell you something different than reality. Sometimes they might lie. Sometimes they might exaggerate. Uh, there are cases where, you know, a psychologist 
thought your their client was doing better and then they commit suicide, for example, mm. or vice versa. They seem really down, but you know, they're actually not suicidal and they're, they're put on suicide watch and things like that. So like psychology, even though it's a, it's a science, right? It still depends on human emotion and human like cognition as well. And like how we discussed it in the beginning of this movie, this movie is sort of questioning, like, what is truth? How do we know the truth? How do we differ it from fiction? How do we know the things that we perceived are facts? What do we choose to believe? These sorts of things. And psychology deals with all of these things. Mm -hmm. So I just thought he was choosing a side and he wasn't like, like really considering all possibilities of a, of the sessions. But could it be possible that somebody goes to their psychologist and says the things that they really can't say to their wife or husband? Like you can't tell your wife exactly, exactly how you feel about her personality or habits, whatever. But you can go to your psychologist and be like, man, how do I deal with this habit that she is doing or personality trait she has that really irks me or bothers me? Could it be possible that somebody, you know, tells more truth to the stranger than actually the, the closest person in their life? Of course, of course they can tell the, they can tell the whole truth, but it's also important how they tell it. Okay. Yeah. Like she, he's annoyed by something that his, wife is doing but how does he tell it does he tell it like it's the end of the world or does he tell it the way it is which is like the least likely possibility i feel like because every time we especially when our emotions are involved and it's about us and it's about our love life our family life we tend to tell things from our perspective so it's not always like subjectively objectively what happened when we talk to our psychologist and the job of the psychologist is to sort of make the patient see more objectively to an extent to say like, well, how do you think your wife sees this event? For example, mm. I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. I felt like um, in that scene with the psychologist, I felt like he was, trying to give his expert opinion because when you're going into court trying to be that expert witness, you know, he was just trying to do the best he could. I think you could read into that scene and say, this is a, another guy trying to mansplain to a woman and to the world how this man felt. Uh, but, you know, Sandra was trying to be able to push back and say that, you know, there's two sides to the story, which there always is. Um, that's just my interpretation of that scene. It was one of the more, you know, testy, confrontational parts of the film. And I enjoyed that back and forth, especially when uh, the lawyer uh, uh, for Sandra, you know, was questioning the psychiatrist and asked him, has anybody ever committed suicide as one of your clients? And he said, uh, you know, no, essentially. Uh, but then the lawyer snapped back and said, well, you're not an expert on suicide because, you know, <laughs> you haven't had it, that happen around you. I thought that was kind of a good back and forth, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah, definitely. And I, I really like the fact that Sandra said, if I had a psychologist and my psychologist went on the stance, like he could say the same things about, you know, Samuel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He could tell about like, oh, Samuel was treating her so bad that he might have, you know, had a, an explosion of rage and mm -hmm. hit her for example. Yeah. Now, at this part of the courtroom drama of the film, I was thinking about like how different the court system is in France to the US because they don't have a jury per se. They have, I think, a collection of judges, right, who make the decision. And, uh, you know, in the US, we have like a jury of 12 people, 12 average citizens who get called in to do the job and one judge who sort of makes sure that the case goes smoothly. But it looked like in France they had like 13 people <laughs> up on the uh, up on the pole who were like some of them were dressed up formally like judges and other people looked like they were just pulled off the street. And then you had another box of people who were dressed up like judges to the side as well. And then random people in the crowd. When you compare this to like, you know, Turkey, did you see any similarities, differences when it comes to this murder trial? Uh, 
I'm not that familiar with like Turkish law system when it comes to like the court, but I don't know if we have a jury in Turkey. I think we just have like the judge. Mm-hmm. So one judge. Yeah, I think so. So it's like very different if it's like that. Yeah. <laughs> and which which also enables a lot of fuckery to happen. Yeah. Yeah. As well, but mm-hmm. yeah. What about like? What do you think? Is it which which one seems better? Just watching this movie, America um, or France? I think, I think either system could work as well. Uh, it's just about the the trying to control biases, right, and mistreatment in the court system. I'm not impartial to the American system over the uh, French system or European system. It doesn't matter. It's just about which system does best at controlling bias. And uh, I think that could also relate to culture as well because of America's racist history. You know, there's unfair bias in our court system. In France, is there the same thing? Because, you know, I'm pretty sure if we look at the jails in France, it's it's a lot of Algerian, Tunisian, and African men in there as well. Uh, So I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out whichever system works best on getting the best outcomes that are the most fair, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, in terms of like deciding whether it's truth or not, I think jury is more important than the judge. Mm -hmm. So I wish we had that system as well in Turkey. So, you know, because if if it's only the judge deciding on it, then we can't really be sure if it's fair or not. Right, right. And if, you know, if you're going to analyze this film as a feminist film and take into take Sandra's gender into account. I think also you can't watch this film without taking her race into account as well. As a white uh, French woman who seems like she is upper middle class, uh, you know, doing fairly well, um, I think there is the argument to make that Sandra's, you know, whiteness protected her in court as well. You know, she was presumed innocent. Not only did she have the woman card uh, on her side, but she also had the card of, you know, fitting the, just fitting the role of a person who wouldn't normally do this, if that makes sense. But yeah, had she I mean, been a had she been a black French woman, an Algerian, Tunisian, Moroccan French woman, I think there might have been, you know, more to uh, uh, work against her in court. Yeah, that perceptions come automatically, mm-hmm. like in our world, where we see like white people in general as more uh, pure. Mm-hmm. Or incapable of committing a certain crimes, so yeah. I think that just comes automatically. Just her being white, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are you tired? <laughs> no. Okay, you sound like beaten down. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sandra's white. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm okay. I'm not tired. Okay, all right. but we also find out at this part that like Sandra's husband sort of is the reason why, you know, uh, Daniel has the eye problems he has. Now, it's not really explained if he's, like, completely blind or or partially blind, but basically he got hit by a motorcycle when Sam didn't uh, come to pick him up from school on time. And then Sandra says, you know, she does kind of resent him for this, and he was resenting himself a bit, and that's how he got on depressants in the first place. Uh, did you have any comments about that revelation? Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't think he was guilty of her son being like, you know, partially blind. And I think he was partially blind because when he saw his father dead, he didn't like bump into his father. He like saw it and then like collapsed next to him. Mm -hmm. So he must have seen like a blur Mm -hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think he's partially blind from that like theory mm-hmm. and yeah, I didn't, I didn't think he was to blame for it. And I didn't think like Sandra at the end blamed him for it. Like, yeah, maybe in the beginning, like she said, she might've blamed him for, you know, for the accident, but at towards the end of her speech in there, she said something like, you know, I was just sort of mad at him for projecting his like melancholia or other sad emotions to this incident Mm -hmm. and then like you know basically loving to suffer 
mm. and then blaming this incident. And that's why she was actually mad at him. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there was any sort of narrative purpose for making Daniel blind? Because that's what the YouTuber that we watched beforehand was saying, like, Daniel's blindness is meant to represent us not being able to fully see the truth and having to construct narratives to deal with the discon disconnects or dissonance of this world around us. Um, okay. I'm going to go back to the feminist uh, aspect uh -huh. uh, because I feel like whenever certain things like this happen in, in a couple's life about a child's accident, abortion, maybe death of a child, things like that. Most of the time, what we see is a woman collapsing maybe sometimes going into depression, um, not having sex anymore. And then sort of like the husband is the strong one, right? They stand up, they try to support their wives. And sometimes also like when they, when they are like at a total disconnect, then they, you know, cheat or they turn into divorce. Mm. Uh, but in this case, once again, it was reversed. Sandra was the person who was sort of keeping it up and, you know, she was trying to continue with her life and Samuel was the person who didn't want to have sex. He was, you know, depressed and things like that. So once again, I think there's like that different dynamic there. That, okay. that was the purpose for me. That, that was the purpose of Daniel being blind. Yeah is to talk about him not being able to see his parents have sex? Yes, but also... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, of course not. But it was just sort of... It was just sort of reflecting this cliche of the result of an accident, but then reversing the their gender roles. Uh, but at the same time, the video that we watched, the explanation video... They also said, like, Daniel's blindness was a symbol of, like, truth not being, you know, available to us all the time. Mm. And, like, us just assuming certain truths ourselves or right. choosing to believe certain truths ourselves. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, when we think about Daniel's character, right, this young boy, he's 11 years old, turning 12 by the time the trial happens, you know, he is blind and he is like talented, right? Like he's playing the piano, uh, and, you know, trying to deal with his emotions by, uh, playing these, you know, symphonies on the, on the piano and, and stuff like that. And there are these touching scenes when his mother, you know, plays with him and they both like cry together. And Daniel sort of has to like figure out everything around him, uh, through the people around him, through entering the world of adults. The court assigns like this woman that comes to stay with Sandra and Daniel in the house to make sure that Sandra isn't, you know, tempting Daniel to say something different in court or change his testimony and stuff like that. And so Daniel was forced to like, you know, try to rationalize everything that's happening from all these adults that are like acting around him, but he has to do it without the sight of his eyes. Right. And that makes everything so different. He can only go by people's words mostly and the vibes that they give him by what he says. And uh, I, that's what I think is the purpose of him not having his eyes, right? He, like, feels the emotions probably more than anybody in this film because he doesn't see anything that's happening. He's just hearing it all. Yeah, it, but it's also a bit ironic as well or paradoxical. Like, I don't know, because, you know, most of the time people say that they can know if a person is lying or not from their eyes mm -hmm. or from their face. Mm hmm uh, or the eyes are the mirror to the soul or, you know, all of these things. But, that... but it can also work in reverse. Somebody could be lying to you, but because you're seeing them, they can have body language that can convince you otherwise. Yeah. Very professional liars. I feel like most people do give away certain like physical clues to them lying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're a psychopath, sure. Uh, but. Yeah, I feel like that's also a bit, a bit ironic, like, or like a play of a, of the director or of the, whoever wrote the story. Mm -hmm. Like, it's clever. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. I got you. I got you. 
Well, let's get to the meat and potatoes. So in the recorded fight that's played in court, Samuel accuses Sandra of plagiarism, infidelity, and exerting control over his life before their protracted argument turns physically violent. The prosecution claims that all the violence came from Sandra. She counters that while she had slapped Samuel, the rest of the violence heard was her husband beating on himself. After Sandra admits to an affair with a woman the year before Samuel's death, the prosecution argues that Samuel's loud music indicated jealousy over Sandra's flirting with the interviewer, leading to the physical confrontation later. The prosecutor also notes Sandra's pattern of writing personal conflicts into her stories and how murdering her husband mirrors a minor character's thoughts from her most recent novel. In turn, Sandra protests that one recording does not represent the nature of their relationship, nor do the words of a character in a novel reflect her own inclinations. What did you think about that? Yeah, this was definitely one of the most intriguing parts of the movie, like with the couple fight, but also this usage of literature within the court. And there's a question that rises like, okay, do the stuff the writers write, do they reflect what they feel inside? Can it all be just a really like imagination, just fiction? Even if it's imagination, can we still accuse them of wanting to do those things or having felt those things or having imagined those things? So that's a very interesting question that, you know, the, the court scene asks the audience, I feel like. And when it comes to the couple fights, it was juicy. <laughs> Uh, it was definitely really good. And the whole time I felt like Samuel was asking, was wanting for Sandra to be more of a traditionally feminine role in their relationship. She, mm -hmm. he was like, you know, why can't you let me lead? Why can't I have like the time to do what I want? And, uh, why can't you do the chores? You know, mm -hmm. why can't you speak my language? And I just felt, I felt Sandra. I felt like she had a point. And, uh, I sort of, you know, was on the side of Sandra in that argument because, yeah, like, and also I had like the feminist rage in me as well because mm -hmm. I was thinking, yo, this is like what men say. Um, like I said before. So yeah, I had that too. And I was like, go Sandra, go. <laughs> but of course I was sad like when she ended up beating him <laughs> or like not beating him but she slapped him that, or at least that's what she said and then he sort of just got mad and punched the wall himself and hit himself in the head uh, so yeah what did you think I thought the fight uh, was vague when the all right when we see When the fight, when the fight, when they play the audio of the fight, right, they have the transcripts up in court, right? And, uh, Samuel was writing all of this down. He was like recording his fights and transcribing them, uh, for some project he was working on, right? And so when, when the audio begins, this is our actual first time seeing Samuel on screen. And, um, like you said, describing the fight, it seemed like, you know, It, it, there was this imbalance of time and power in the relationship. And I feel like on one hand, I don't feel like Sam was trying to control um, Sandra. I don't feel like he was trying to like, you know, make her do more or make her act more like a woman or a housewife the way, you know, a traditional sexist man would be trying to do for, for a woman like that. You get what I'm saying? Uh, yes, I get what you're saying. And I agree, like, he didn't want the absolute traditional, you know, her cooking in the kitchen all the time, not working and only taking care of the children. He didn't want that, but he wanted some sort of submission from her. Mm -hmm. If that mm -hmm. makes sense. Like, yeah, that's not what he wanted, but, uh, I don't know. He wanted to be in charge during, like, sex, for example. Mm -hmm. And just like more minor things, you know, not like in your face, sexist, traditional things, mm -hmm. but more undercover sexist things. <laughs> right. I I feel like their fight was a bit more balanced than what you're giving it. I It doesn't feel like, you know, Sam was trying to 
I didn't get the feeling like Sam was just trying to control her. I feel like Sam had the problem of not knowing how to do what his wife was doing, which was being successful writing while also managing being a father. Cause I believe he took his job of being a father seriously. That's why he said he chose to t- uh, homeschool Daniel and be with him. And I believe a lot of that also came from, you know, the guilt he had of his son getting in the accident. So to make it up to his son, he's going to be the one to be there to teach him, educate him and raise him. Um, I, I also didn't get the feeling like, you know, Sandra was saying the stuff that men say, like you said, I disagree with you on that. I feel like men don't just automatically go to like, well, you chose this. Like both people can say that men and women can say that. So I disagree with you on that there. Um, I feel like the, the part when the audio cuts off and the fight happens, that took me back to me being a kid and hearing like horrible fights that my parents were having where plates were flying and people were getting slapped and, you know, things were breaking in another room. And then, then I just have to look sadly out the window like a puppy. Like <laughs> it was traumatic for me. And, uh, when she told the story of what the violence was, she said that, you know, she slapped him which I'm glad that she admitted that part, right? Because I thought she was going to say, oh, yeah, he attacked me. He was violent with me or something like that. So I'm glad that she was honest because it looks actually worse for her to say that she was a violent person in court while she's accused of murder. But I was also thinking about one of my best friends in the past. His name was Phil. Phil got into a fight with his girlfriend. He left the room and he locked her out of his like house So she started like beating on herself and called the police and said, Phil beat on me. (laughs) So when she was saying like, oh yeah, he just started hitting himself. Like it just made me think of that as well. And, um, you know, there might've been a mix of truth and fiction in that. You know, I think there might've been the possibility she continued to beat on him, hit on him. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I was definitely considering that possibility as well. Um, when it comes to like what you said earlier, that's the thing. <laughs> okay, let me put on my feminist mask. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like most of the time, men aren't able to see that sort of inner and uh, systematic struggle of woman because it doesn't seem like it's their fault. Mm-hmm. And to an extent, it's not. It's like the system's fault, right? Mm. Uh, there are a lot of women who feel like Samuel, who feel mm-hmm. like, th- yes, they take care of their child because they want to. They take care of the family because they want to. They also work because they want to. But it's like, while they're handling all of that, uh, their partner might have more time and freedom with their actions and it's like they they want to blame them, but they also can't because it's their own choosing and the, their own willingness and someone has to take that role. And it's more traditionally taken by women. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it creates this like, you know, I don't know what it is, like this crisis or this sort of just um, life struggle for mm-hmm. women. And that's why I thought this was like, a reversed a roles reversed you know fight i'm not going to i'm not going to act like you know because of me being a man that there are some things that i might be blind to right that because of the privilege i have of being in this body i'm i'm not going to be able to see everything the way a woman is going to see it or experience it or interact with it like watching this film and seeing that fight play out hell you might be triggered you might have been triggered watching that fight on screen because you felt like, damn, that's something Simon said to me. And I'm so glad Sandra is clapping back at Simon. I mean, Samuel, like <laughs> maybe that's how you're reacting. But um, yeah, I just I'm just giving my impression and my feeling of it, though. Like, I feel like I'm pretty good at spotting, you know, that that male bias, that chauvinism and stuff like that. And I feel like, you know, this 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 fight was more centered on the failures a little bit of this man not being able to manage his lifestyle the way he wanted to and being jealous of his wife uh, rather more than 
him, you know, trying to put his foot down and say, I'm tired of you running the show. I need to wear the big boy pants and win the show. Do you get what I'm saying? I get what you're saying. And first of all, I just want to make this clear. Like, I'm not saying all men are like this. I'm just saying it might be harder for, you know, just, some men to You're just to saying see. your and husband is like this. No, <laughs> no. And it's also like the same thing for women, right? I might not see certain struggles that you have as well. And you might clearly be able to see them and spot them. Uh -huh. So it's like, it goes both ways. Um, yeah. But like, what you're saying is like sort of what I'm trying to say as well. You say that he's not able to accomplish what he wanted in life. And then he's jealous of his, um, you know, wife. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm also trying to say. Like most women who fall under the traditional roles probably feel like that because mm -hmm. they, they had a different idea of their life and they cannot accomplish that. And therefore they might be resentful, maybe not jealous, maybe jealous, maybe resentful of their spouses for having to accomplish what they wanted. Right. And also like the fault, like the fact that there is no fault in both of them. Mm -hmm. So there, they might be like, who am I going to blame? I cannot put this blame 100% on my husband, but I cannot also like put it on me either. Right. So there's that frustration. And that's what I was trying to say. That's it. I get, I get you. I get you. It is frustrating, but they were both frustrated because she was frustrated by living in you know, bumfuck wherever France. And he was frustrated by the fact he, he quit his job, had an accident with his son that made him lose his sight and he still can't write. Right. And on top of that, his wife is like taking the outlines of the stuff he didn't finish and turning them into like best selling novels. So there's like multiple things that they're frustrated by. Right. And, um, yeah, those things seem to hit like a boiling point in that conversation. But I think a bigger question that we're sort of skipping over is why was he even recording this and transcribing it in the first place? Why do you think he would be recording his own fights and trying to do this? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a question they also like voice in the court, right? Did he start this fight just because he can record it and have material? Mm-hmm. Like, was that, is that a possibility? And I felt like that might have been a possibility since, you know, um, he, maybe he wants to get revenge on his wife in a literature kind of way. So it, mm. it could have be, been like, she took my idea, so now I'm going to take her life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't know, like our, our arguments and then like just put it in a novel and make her look bad. Right. I, I, I don't know. So yeah, but. Other than that, I felt like it was just like a project for him. I don't think he recorded because he thought, oh, my wife would might kill me. I, I'm going to take it there. I think maybe Sam had a conspiracy. He really hated his broad by the end of his life. So he was like, you know what I'm going to do? I might kill myself and I'm going to try to leave as many breadcrumbs as evidence to say she did it. <laughs> So, so you're saying like he committed suicide and then he made everyone blame his wife? Yeah, like he wow. was like, I'm going to do whatever he can. <laughs> that, that might be true. That might be true. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, you know, I, I, the fight was such a pivotal point of the movie. And, uh, you know, the, the scene when the prosecutor starts reading from the book that Sandra wrote where one of the characters talks about, you know, I might kill my husband and, you know, the body I love is now lifeless and dead and stuff like that. It made me think about how in America so many rappers are on trial for being involved in gangs or criminal organizations and they're using their lyrics against them in court. And, you know, generally I'm like freedom of speech. It's art. Art should not be a part of prosecuting somebody. Uh, it doesn't work that way for movies or for books in general, but if somebody makes a song or writes something down that's meant to be art, it shouldn't be used against them. But how did you feel about that, them bringing Sandra's books as sort of like evidence against her? Um, I also agree with you on this topic. I think people can create certain things in their head 
and maybe even fantasize about it, yeah, but that doesn't mean that they would do it. And that's, I think that's also a bit like a protective thing that the human mind does. Maybe you fantasize about like the weirdest stuff ever, but that might keep you from actually doing it. So yeah, I think like we cannot use human creativity like that as evidence because it's okay to like, it's freaking okay to be fantasizing about whatever you want to fantasize about, whether it's, you know, shooting up a gas station or whether if it's cheating on your husband, killing your wife, like whatever it is, you couldn't, you can't really like put law and chains into your, you know, imagination, mm -hmm. even, even if it includes something bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's just stupid. But what if somebody says, you know, they write a book called Johnny's Dead and it's all about how they killed Johnny and then Johnny actually pops up dead. Should that not be used as evidence, even if the book is labeled as fiction? E yes, that person could be considered a suspect, but doesn't mean he's the guilty one. Like, that can't be the pure evidence that they decide that the writer is going to go to jail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They have to so, find more, yeah. more evidence. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's definitely not like a solid evidence. Right. Uh, so that's what I, I think. Right. Uh, but I think the point of the film of trying to use her words against her was less about the issue of whether art should be used to prosecute uh, criminals, but more about the idea that, you know, this woman might have been planning this the entire time and dropping hints about this the entire time and using her work as some sort of outlet to express her rage against her husband, right? So, I don't know, what do you, any comments on that? Uh, yeah, there was definitely that, like, oh, she might be plotting uh, vibe, but then I feel like her defense to these sorts of things were, like, mostly you're taking everything out of context. Like, you're just showing this one event, one passage, one paragraph, and then saying, like, I might have done it when I'm, like, in that moment or when I'm, you know, using my creativity writing a novel. Yeah. So, like, you cannot always just take one thing and then say that reflects the truth. Yeah. Because, like she says, like, every couple fights. Mm -hmm. Or, like, what her lawyer says. So, like, Stephen King, that, like... Then Stephen King is a serial killer. Right. You know, like we cannot say all those things. Or like you said, are all the, all of those rappers that talk about like gang violence, are they violent really? Mm hmm You know? Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Well, moving on in the story. So a distraught Daniel insists on testifying before closing arguments the following Monday. The judge lays strict ground rules to prevent anyone from influencing his testimony and brings in a court monitor, Marge. Daniel then asks that Sandra leave their house for the weekend so he can be alone with Marge and Snoop. He recalls that when Samuel overdosed, Snoop also fell sick, possibly due to having eaten Samuel's vomit. He then deliberately feeds Snoop aspirin and finds it has the same effect, which aligns with Sandra's testimony. Daniel confides to Marge his anguish, and she advises him that if he doesn't know what is really true, he can instead decide what's true for him. Wow. On the witness stand, Daniel says he can comprehend his father taking his own life, but not the murder scenario. He says that when he and Samuel were driving Snoop to the veterinarian, Samuel spoke about the need to be prepared that those he loves will die and to know that his life will go on, which Daniel now interprets as his father's own suicidal thoughts. Sandra is acquitted after Daniel's testimony. When she returns home, Daniel tells her he was afraid of her homecoming, and she says that she was too. The two embrace. As Sandra heads to bed, she lingers at a photo of her and Samuel before falling asleep with Snoop. What did you think about basically the ending? Yeah, I was feeling really sad for Daniel because he's a kid that has to decide whether her mom is a murderer or not. And he's hearing like all these new things about, you know, his parents' relationships, that her his dad was on antidepressant, he tried to commit suicide, you know, her her mom was cheating on his dad. 
she slapped him <laughs> and things like that, which is a lot to like handle. And plus there's a possibility that like, I'm sure he's thinking like, if my mom is not found guilty, I might be going home with the murder mm. as well. So it's like insane, insane thoughts. Right. Um, or if, if, he, if he doesn't go home with a the murder, then her mom might go to jail and not be guilty. Mm -hmm. So it's like two extremes, a lot of extremes. Um, and I just felt bad for him. And I thought like they portrayed the actor portrayed like his desperation really good. When mm -hmm. he asked his mom to leave, I thought, Oh shit. Like, you know, <laughs> he's gonna say that her mom is guilty. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that's what he was believing up until he gave his testimony, which I thought was a great directoral sort of wrong lead in because mm -hmm. when he revealed that story with his dad you know his dad's basically when his his dog gets sick his dad basically tells him like you know your dog might die one day and you have to be ready for it and then what he said was i think my dad was talking about himself and i mm -hmm. believe he committed suicide mm -hmm. he said something like that So, yeah, I was shocked. I didn't think he was going to defend his mom mm. because at the same time in the movie, they were showing like passages of Sandra after the court drinking uh, with the lawyer and sometimes like looking too happy for whatever is going on. But then also <laughs> there were like, you know, these breakdowns, like she would be laughing and making a joke. And then two seconds later, she would start crying. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't like tell what was like, what was his mental, her mental state was as well. Mm -hmm. What yeah. did you think? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to just go through everything. because really quickly, I just want to get through it really quickly. First and foremost, Daniel was a soldier and you know, the court sat him down and said, I don't think you should come to court tomorrow. You're not going to like what you're going to hear. And Daniel's like, no, I want to hear. I got to hear this. I'm going to hear about it anyway from TV, Internet, social media. So let me be there and let me just deal with it. So I think this film is also a bit of a coming of age story of a child having to grow up very quickly and sort of like become a man uh, by dealing with something very traumatic, the death of his father. There's an old African saying that a boy doesn't become a man until his father dies, no matter how old he is. And Daniel is becoming a man here because he's facing the trauma and making hard decisions. So by telling his mother to leave the house, he's saying, like, I have to make this decision by myself. I cannot depend on my mom. I can't depend on the world to take care of me. I got to do this myself. Another thing I thought was interesting was the conversation between Daniel and Sam in the car. Uh, there's a possibility it could have all been fake or that partially it could have been fake, right? And I think a lot of that might have had to do the in with the influence of Marge, the girl who was there appointed by the court to take care of Daniel and make sure that his mother didn't influence him. Because Marge says, you know, you can decide what's true. Okay, I don't know if we can decide if the sky is blue or grass is green, but okay. Um, and... I like how the comparison between dogs and fathers are to some degree, because uh, according to Daniel, his father said, you know, your dog is always thinking about you, caring about you, seeing things you don't see, trying to make you happy. And one day he will pass on. And one day I'm going to be gone, too. It might be hard. It might not. It won't be the end of the world, but uh, you'll live and you should keep on living. Right. So. You know, that makes me think about, you know, all the hard stuff that I had to hear from my father growing up. <laughs> my father telling me some hard, uncomfortable truths that I didn't, that I wasn't ready for, but now I've grown into. And so, yeah, that just makes me think about all those things. And um, very interesting that uh, after Daniel gives his testimony, basically the, the court says, okay, well, I guess she's innocent. Her son, you know, seems to like her, so why not let her off? And I think, once again, this show is like a little bit of female privilege and white privilege, because up to that point in the case, it seemed like it was shut on Sandra. Like, if it were not for Daniel, if he never said anything, or if he gave a testimony in the opposite, it, it would have been Sandra got 25 to life. But uh, she was able to skate by because of that. And uh, last thing I want to say is that there's a scene when Sandra and Vincent, 
her lawyer are in the Chinese restaurant celebrating after, you know, she was acquitted. And they have this very touching moment where, you know, Vincent, uh, well, I forgot the name of the lawyer, but her lawyer. Vincent. Oh, his name is Vincent. Sorry. Yeah. Vincent, you know, said earlier that he had affection for Sandra, but it went unrequited. They never really got together. And at that point in the film, I feel like I'm going to just take it there. I don't know how I can watch this film or give critique of it without going red pill. But I'm just going to say what I think the red pill community might say. They're going to be like, okay, now that Sandra's husband is dead, now she has more romantic options. She has her son. She has her house. And now she even has a dog that she can cuddle with. Isn't this the white woman's dream? I'm pretty sure that like the red pill community is going to be so pissed by watching this film. Now, I, that's not what I think. That's not what I think. But it's hard for me to watch this film without thinking of like those, those, you know, chauvinists who would see that. You know what I mean? But, uh, as far as Vincent, like, I feel like, you know, Vincent really wanted to have that relationship with Sandra, but she's like distant from him. And, uh, Sandra actually really does miss Samuel and the love that she actually has, which is why she looks at that picture. Uh, but, you know, she has to move on with her life because once again, Sam made his choice. And now she has to continue making her choices, which is to live. So that's my opinion. Yeah. Um, just on the last part that you said, the red pill opinion, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's definitely very, very red pill because we can say the same thing about millions of femicides that happen. And the husbands, some of them go to jail and then get out. Some of them don't even go to jail uh, because... I don't know, the the wife was cheating, you know? Does that justify the killing? Eh. Uh, so things like that. And then they end up, you know, being free at the end and having another family, maybe having even more children. This is so much more when compared to women. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at, like, the, the numbers and the statistics, especially, like, talking about Turkey here as well. Uh, there's just a lot of femicides, so yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. I guess it's a bit of a justice there. Right, and, right. And um, another thing I wanted to say about like uh, Daniel's search for truth, I thought it was like very fascinating that he was ready to accidentally kill his his dog mm-hmm. that he loved very much, as we can see throughout the movie, in order to find the truth. He was yeah, climbing. I'm- I'm sure Snoop was like, can y'all stop messing with me? <laughs> can y'all yeah. stop giving me drugs? I'm tired. Like, I am not Snoop Dogg. I am <laughs> Snoop a dog. <laughs> yeah, like he was basically experimenting on his dog to find the truth, whether, uh, you know, his mom actually killed his dad. Mm-hmm. He was going up to the attic where, you know, this kid is blind and he can, I don't know, fall or whatever. He was going up to the attic, looking at, looking down from the, you know, from the window to see. And he was just trying, like, so hard. And he was like, bro, like, I wish somebody just gave me the truth so it will just be easier. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, you know, real life doesn't work like that. And what Marge said was true as well. We have to sometimes create, you know, our own truths in order for us to move on with our lives and have some sort of resolution. Right. Because if we're constantly chasing a truth that we can never know, then that's just going to be paranoia Mm -hmm. or some sort of disruption in our mental health. Yeah. Um, And it's like that in a lot of things, you know, if for example, a woman might, or a man might suspect that their partner is cheating on them, but they don't have a solid evidence. And when they confront, confront their partner, they, they say that they're not cheating. So you have like two choices. Uh, let's say you did your research, you looked at everything and there's no proof that there's cheating, but something inside of you tells, I don't know, that they're cheating. And you can either go with their cheating or you can say, okay, I'm not going to assume that they're cheating unless I have solid proof. And either one of them is going to make you feel like at some sort of resolution, but you have to truly believe it. Because if you don't believe it and then you go on with your relationship, then you're just going to have a paranoia. And I, I feel like, you know, 
um, Daniel's case was like this. Like, he truly right. believed that his mother was not the killer. He either truly believed or just wanted to believe. And yeah. had it, and, and wanted to have some closure with everything, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I really like what you're saying about how this film deals with truth. Vincent said multiple times in many different scenes, like, the truth doesn't matter. It's about sort of like the story that we're going to tell. That's paraphrasing like something he said. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the last thing I have to say about truth is like, how do we understand truth with our criminal justice systems, right? Because in this film, there really is never that scene that shows exactly what happened to Samuel. It's sort of like we're in the audience of that courtroom and we're just getting the facts as they come. And the resolution that's handed down by the court, we now have to accept it because like you said, Acti, like we have to deal with the truth and just sort of accept it. What our society has said that we have reached the most logical, reasonable truth here and not deal with the paranoia that we have murderers walking amongst us, right? Uh, we have to deal with just that being, you know, what it is, right? Um, it's still crazy because you could still go on YouTube or websites that will have many different theories on to how actu Samuel actually died, right? And I think that goes to show, like, people really don't have full faith in our criminal justice systems to reach the truth. Because each of us could point out a case that we'd say, oh no, the truth was lost here, or they got the, they came to a falsehood. Like OJ Simpson, people will debate until the end of time whether OJ actually killed his wife or not, even though our criminal justice system said OJ was innocent, right? Um, there are still white supremacists out there that will say, no, Derek Chauvin didn't kill George Floyd. George Floyd died of X, Y, and Z even though Chauvin was found guilty of a murder that the whole world saw. You get what I'm saying? So it's crazy how in this film, it really does make you feel like we were just witnessing another day of our court systems, no matter what country you are in the world, deciding on whether somebody committed a murder or not. Because even after turning off the film, you're still like doubting. The same way you would doubt if you turned on the news and read a story that somebody was found not guilty for killing their husband. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And also adding to what you say, uh, what you're saying and with all the examples that you gave as well. Um, I, I like the fact that they showed a little clip of the media, if you mm -hmm. remember, and they were talking about like how, uh, Sandra's novels were mm -hmm. hinting that she might've killed her husband. And then one of the guys who was just like a talk show host, he said something like, You know, that is just more interesting, like thinking that she planned this everything and then she even wrote it and now she's playing the character in her book. And that's just much more interesting than like just him committing suicide. Right. And it like shows again, you know, a lot of things can influence what we're thinking. And um, yeah, just like people love drama. They love <laughs> as drama. Well. They yeah. love drama. Especially media. And the thing is, you know, we did the review of Savior Complex and technically Renee Bach was never found guilty of like murdering a child. She just paid restitution uh, for the ch two children that died under her watch. And she didn't have to admit guilt as a part of her uh, uh, conclusion of that civil case. Right. But still, Renee Bach is being haunted online by people calling her a murderer And people, you know, taking pictures of where she lives now and stuff like that. And for the hypothetical Sandra, she'll have to deal with that, too. Every time she publishes a book, the woman who was accused of murdering her husband is back with a new novel. And now she's going to be a part of the media ecosystem of, like, you know, did she really kill her husband? Like, uh, all sorts of conspiracy videos made about her online and stuff like that. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I just have one question for you. Yeah. Uh, going back to like the justice system and especially like in your country and also in Europe as well. Like, do you think there is a system that, um, might prevent for unfair things to happen like this? Or is there a justice system that could solve this issue? Like cases like, you know, Sandra's case where we don't know the truth. 
or maybe cases like, you know, the savior complex case, Rene Box case that, you know, it's very somewhat subjective. Um, so like, do you think there is a system that can handle this and um, we're just not doing it? I am once I am not knowledgeable of all the systems around the world, but what I would say that I think would make many Western criminal justice systems better is by having blind, um, defendants, meaning that you do not see the defendant. Maybe you know as limited information about them as possible. You don't know their gender. You don't know their age. You don't know their their sexual orientation, their race. I think that would make things a lot better if we were somehow able to, you know, diminish as many qualities about the person from entering into the space and only judging the case on its merits, if that makes sense. Um, and also on top of that, I think it would be very, very interesting if in the criminal justice system they added AI into the um into the cases as well you know ai being uh defense attorneys or prosecutors or people litigating the law as well not not that we don't need the human touch but ai involved in in part of the you know entire trial process i think um that's my opinion if that makes sense yeah i mean i don't know if ai would do more harm or less harm because For example, in this case, uh, Sandra being a mom, right? It gives somewhat of a sympathy role for the judges, uh, for the juror, and she gains a sympathy role from there. Or when she says things like, you know, if I had a therapist, I might have, you know, the same judge, the same argument could have done about me. Mm-hmm. And AI would just like, wouldn't take these sort of things into consideration. Mm -hmm. And at one point, maybe like on one side is good because it will be perfectly fair, regardless of like sex and race and gender and all of those things. Uh, but at the same time, like, is it sometimes okay to have sympathy vote for a mom, for example? Mm -hmm. So yeah, when you have AI, you sort of eliminate that human like emotion from it. And I don't know if it's that solely a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I think what should happen is that the defendant should be able to willingly submit whatever information they want the court to know or the jury to know about them. So if you think sympathy would work for you, you can willingly submit. I am a mom. I am a woman. I was in a marriage, whatever, right? Like that. You get what I'm saying? Um, yeah, I think I think people should be able to have some control over parts of their identity that can have negative influences in the perceptions of them. If we're going to have subjective uh, viewers, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, interesting. You I was just curious. Thoughts? You have any uh, thoughts on that? Um, well, that was just like very smart, and no, I don't have. <laughs> I have even less imp information of the, you know, law system, especially mm -hmm. in the West, mm -hmm. than you do. Uh, yeah. But I do agree with you on that, like, having blind jurors. Mm -hmm. Like, first of all, if I'm going to talk about my own country, we have to have jurors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the first step. <laughs> And then maybe we can think about having blind jurors. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, yeah. I see, I see. But uh, overall, what would you rate this film? Um, I think I'm going to rate it uh, an eight. Okay. And would you suggest it to other people? Yes. I think it's interesting, like, uh, you know, drama, judge, court drama, uh, a little bit of, like, suspicion there. Uh, I like the fact that it didn't give out the truth. Because it makes you question, like, what is truth? How do we reach it? What do we mm -hmm. use to reach it? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think, like, if you like court dramas, you should definitely check it out. It wasn't, like, for me, it wasn't boring watching it, like, two and a half hours. It's a long time. Mm -hmm. But it was sort of, you know, flowing. So, yeah. yeah. I would say this film is not for everyone, so I would not recommend it to everyone. If you're only into, like, you know crime thrillers, 
Law and Order, uh, <laughs> you know, NCIS, <laughs> you're going to be into this. Uh, might not be for everyone, uh, but I would give it a 7.5, a 7.5. Uh, I, there's not really much that I would say I critique of this film other than, you know, it might just be a drain for some people. And uh, there could have been some emotional scenes of Sandra crying and uh, that had very little character development or more movement towards the story other than just making you feel more sorry for her, if that makes sense. Um, so that's that would be my critique of it. That would be my critique. And plus, this film is very triggering if you're a uh, male chauvinist, red pill type of dude. Yeah, if you're that type of dude, go and watch it. <laughs> Learn something from it or just get annoyed. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, this has been episode 62 of Simon and Acting Movie Reviews. I really enjoyed this conversation with my wife. Y'all check this out and au revoir.